It will be on affordable housing, community development, and equity. The forum is a part of a series that's been planned by Make Homes Happen, a coalition of housing advocacy groups that are looking to advocate for affordable housing development, preservation, and tenants' rights in Minneapolis through education, advocacy, and public reform. It would seem somehow odd to go through this evening without recognizing what has happened in the last 24 hours in Las Vegas. Um, so I would invite us just a moment of silence and solidarity to um, pray or reflect or whatever is comfortable for your tradition uh, to just pause. Thank you. It is appropriate that we're here at Plymouth Congregational Church for this particular forum. Plymouth has a long history of working diligently with Westminster and DCEH and Beacon and others to develop housing and to work to reform public policy. Uh, so it's a good, a good place for this event. I want to remind you that this will be a ranked choice election. There will be people in um, Guild Hall where we were gathering earlier. If you would like to talk about uh, the details of ranked choice voting, there will be people there uh, who can help you. If you need sign language or trans translation services for Spanish or Somali, um, if you would gather over here at this door, um, we can get that worked out. We have translating equipment as well as sign language. So home is the foundation for healthy families and thriving communities, and it's a critical issue for voters. The mayor of Minneapolis will need to set forth a strong vision for how to address concerns about affordable housing. The purpose of this forum is to better understand the positions of each of these candidates. Make Homes Happen uh, is a nonpartisan organization there will be no winner and no loser declared for tonight, and there will be no endorsements made uh, because Make Homes Happen does not support or oppose individual candidates or parties. The seven candidates that we invited to participate in this forum are the ones that have demonstrated significant voter support and interest by having a legally registered campaign committee which has filed appropriate financial reports showing a significant funding base. We require, these are the folks who by the end of August had raised at least $5,000 for their campaign. So that was the criteria by which they were selected. We're fortunately fortunate to have these qualified candidates with us and we thank them for coming. There'll be time during the forum where volunteers will be walking up and down the aisles with cards for you to write down your written questions, um, turn them in to somebody who is in the aisle and they will be uh, brought forward and we will ask as many as we can. Uh, as is always the case, we will not make it through all of the written questions and for that we apologize ahead of time. Before we begin, we have a few people that we need to thank. First, Plymouth Congregational Church, especially Emily Vanell and Cody Bordeaux, who is our sound technician, Mike McEntee of Uptake, and the Uptake for providing uh, live streaming services, so this event is being live streamed, Wells Fargo for making it possible to offer the translation services in Spanish and Somali, our translators from the Global, Global Village Connections and equipment from the Corcoran Neighborhood Association and Westside Community Organization. Aon for providing post-forum refreshments and tonight's moderator, Curtis Gilbert. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator. Curtis Gilbert is a correspondent for APM Report, a national investigative reporting group based at American Public Media. His recent work is focused on police training, juvenile corrections, and the privatization of American infrastructure. He's also contributed to the Peabody Award-winning podcast, In the Dark. 
Before joining APM Reports, he covered Minneapolis city government for Minnesota Public Radio. So welcome and thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, you can all hear me now. Thank you all for coming. Um, I just wanted to go over uh, the ground rules for tonight. Um, we decided not to use rigid time limits uh, for the candidates. And the idea there is to give you guys an opportunity, if it, you're so moved, to interact with each other, to rebut each other. Um, but just because there are not going to be any flashing lights or buzzers for the candidates, um, doesn't mean that we're inviting them to go on interminably. Um, so uh, what I'd like to say is we want to keep your uh, responses short, to the point, and to about a minute, uh, shorter is good, shorter is great, um, because we've got a lot of candidates and a lot of questions to get through. Uh, so if you're going on way over a minute, I will jump in to ask you to wrap it up. Um, and to know about the questions, the topics came from the sponsors of this event, but I exercised the right as the moderator to reword them and edit them to make them clear and make sure we were getting at what everyone was trying to get at. Um, so uh, we're going to begin with opening statements, and these will be timed. Um, and the reason for that is so everyone gets a feeling for what a minute is. <laughs> um, and I think you drew names to go first, and uh, Aswar Rahman, you're going first. That's a wonderful pronunciation, by the way. Hello, everyone. My name is Aswar Rahman. I'm running for mayor of Minneapolis. Uh, a little bit about me. I grew up in northeast and north Minneapolis. My family immigrated when I was six years old. And in our journey, we were able to build a life for ourselves in Minneapolis. And it, my mother was able to open her store. We worked very hard, put us through college. And now I myself am a small business owner. I work in multimedia, filmmaking, and web design. The biggest problem I have with the direction our city's taken in the past four years is somehow we have b b gotten both less affordable and more dangerous as, as a place to live. We have become a city where the quality of life has deteriorated, and that's just a fact. And when you trace back why it is, why is it that our city's grown, uh, grown unaffordable? Why is it that now in certain parts of town we feel much less safer walking around? It is because of the leadership that has been lacking in City Hall. So I will be working throughout the night to at least convince you that we need new leadership in Minneapolis, and I want to see the city where I was able to build a life for myself, where my family was able to build a life for ourselves, and I want to see that opportunity grow as the years go on. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, next opening statement from Raymond Dean. Hi, and um, I'm grateful that you all are here today to talk about this critical issue facing the city of Minneapolis. I'm the most qualified on the issue of affordable housing. Uh, earlier in my life, I had a construction company. We built homes. I then returned to school to study architecture, and a lot of that was about housing and how cities are built. Uh, the firm that I worked at for nearly a decade, 95% of the work they did was around housing, some of that affordable. Uh, I know that we went through a really, really tough time with the recession. I was out knocking doors with my neighbors to make sure that they were able to keep their homes during the mortgage foreclosure crisis. You know, and then I was fortunate to be elected to uh, serve the people of Minneapolis in the state legislature where I was able to secure over $200 million. But I wasn't done. In 2012, I received a Bush Fellowship, and I looked at the intersection of transportation, how we build our cities, and housing. And uh, this has been my life's passion, my life's work, and uh, I look forward to working with all of you in the future as we address the needs for the city of Minneapolis. Thanks, Raymond Dean. Um, Betsy Hodges, current mayor. Well, good evening. Thank you all for attending tonight. I am Betsy Hodges. I am the mayor of Minneapolis, and I'm running for a second term. And one of the things we provide for one another as human beings is shelter. That as a community, we get to come together to make sure people have the basics of life to thrive. We do that strongly and best in cities. And much of my career for the past 20 plus years has been about how we create housing opportunities with and for one another. And certainly in the last 12 years at the city of Minneapolis, first as council member, now as mayor, and also on the executive committee and now co-chair of Heading Home Hennepin. And yes, I have invested over $40 million in my budgets in the past three years for affordable housing. 
uh, and I've invested, te proposed tens of millions more in uh, 2018, but I've also brought innovation that if our only housing strategy is about creating affordable housing instead of preserving the affordable housing we have, creating market rate housing in neighborhoods that need that, creating stability for renters, uh, and creating home ownership opportunities for everybody, uh, then our plan and our vision for housing in this city is too limited, which is why I brought that innovation to City Hall, and we have a chance to talk about it tonight. But I do ask now, and we'll ask at the end, for your first choice vote for mayor. Thank you, Mayor Hodges. Uh, next opening statement from Tom Hoke. Very good, thank you, and good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good, thank you. So uh, my name is Tom Hoke, and I am a candidate for Mayor of Minneapolis. I'm a Minneapolis native. I was a teacher for Minneapolis Public Schools for several years. I then went to law school and found my way to the city where I did real estate development representing the city's interests. I, I, uh, one of the projects that I worked on was LaSalle Plaza and the State Theater, and I oversaw the restoration of the State Theater, which was really my introduction to the theater world, handled the acquisition and initial operation of the Orpheum Theater, and then was the Deputy Executive Director for the City's Public Housing Authority for six years. So uh, up here, I'm actually the only candidate who has overseen and operated an affordable housing program. I understand the importance that that plays in someone's life. I negotiated the terms of the Holman Consent Decree, bringing $100 million to the city of Minneapolis to transform the near north side and address some of the vestiges of racial discrimination. I then returned to the theaters and founded Hennepin Theater Trust, which I ran, bringing four to 500,000 people to downtown Minneapolis each and every year and breathing new life into our historic theaters. I'm asking for your support on November 7th and to be your first choice. Thank you. Thank you, Tom Hoke. And now we'll hear from Al Flowers. Good evening, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. My name is Al Flowers. Uh, my campaign is called Truth to the People, and, and it's telling the truth. I've been an activist, an organizer. I've owned an uh, early childhood uh, care center uh, with my family. I, I ran it for six years, and then I uh, got into uh, politics. Who would think, you know? Uh, but it, it was uh, something I had a passion about, about all these issues, about uh, education, about housing, about what we can do uh, to stop some of the uh, youth homelessness. These are areas that I've worked for, I've organized over the last 15 years. Some is coming out, uh, just coming out saying what they are doing, but I tell people to beware, to listen to the cold words of medium income. What do medium income mean? If we're gonna get down to the bottom of homelessness and affordable housing, we gotta know uh, those answers before uh, this election is over. So I thank you for the opportunity and, and I look forward to having this discussion tonight. Thank you, Al Flowers. Now we'll hear from Council Member Jacob Frey. My name is uh, Jacob Fry. I'm the city council member for the third ward. I'm a civil rights attorney uh, and I'm running for mayor of Minneapolis because I believe that our city has been in the news for the wrong reasons and we need a fresh start. Uh, right now, more than ever, a public service is not about being somebody, it's about doing something. And right now in Minneapolis, there's a whole lot that we can and need to be doing. And look no further than just right outside at this moment. Uh, you've got a cool night where it is an absolute downpour, and we still have people in our city that are homeless. You know, I believe that everybody in this city deserves an affordable place to stay in a safe and thriving neighborhood. They deserve the ability to go home at night, shut the door on the world, lay, there, lay down and rejuvenate for the next day. And not everybody has that. Not everybody has that. So affordable housing is the reason that I studied law. It's the main reason that I got into politics. And it's the primary reason why I'm running for mayor right now. We have a dearth of it right now in our city. We have a crisis and we need some very clear action steps as to how we're gonna make sure that everybody can live in our great city and everybody can live in a neighborhood of their choice. I do not believe in segregating people off. I believe that you should be able to have affordable housing throughout the city and I'll spend the next hour and a half telling you about how we're gonna do that. Thank you, Council Member Fry. And last, we'll hear an opening statement from Nikima Levy-Pounds. Good evening, my name is Nikima Levy-Pounds and it's a privilege to be here with you all today. I'm honored to join you in this discussion and in, in talking about affordable housing. I think affordable housing is imperative for the city of Minneapolis, but as we're talking about the issue of housing, we need to think about those who are on the margins and those who are most vulnerable within our society. 
and how it's very possible for someone to have a roof over their heads, but no food on the table, or to have a roof over their heads, but their children are attending an underperforming school, or for someone to have a roof over their heads, and they don't have adequate employment opportunities, or jobs that pay a living wage, or jobs that respect their human dignity and their human rights. From my perspective, we cannot look at the issue of affordable housing in a silo, the way that the city currently operates. We need to see affordable housing as part of intersecting issues that impact the city of Minneapolis, a city that is not equitable for all people. And so as your next mayor, I want to help put together an equity plan, which we currently don't have, to help shift the paradigm across every key indicator of quality of life, affordable housing, of course, being one of the most important. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the candidates. And um, everyone av was averaging a little over a minute. So, you know, try to cut a sentence or two off of the next answer. <laughs> we'll try to make up some time as we go along. Okay, so we're going to rotate who starts each question. So this first, we're going to start with Raymond Dean here. And um, it's, the first question is really the big question of the evening. And we'll get into some of the more nitty-gritty policy details after this. But the big first question is, how should Minneapolis ensure that it has enough safe, high quality, affordable housing, and what are you going to do as mayor to get us there? It's a big task before the city of Minneapolis, and when we talk about affordable and safe housing, it means many different things to many different people. Uh, when I think about affordable housing, I think about those individuals that actually struggle uh, with staying in their homes. And some of the specific things that I think we need to do is we need to bring more money into affordable housing. Uh, what that means is that means increasing the amount of money that we have in the affordable housing trust fund. Uh, the city of Minneapolis is in a position where they can actually do a bond offering that could actually deliver more money to affordable housing. And then we would work with our nonprofit partners and we would work with the private sector to make sure that we're building out those number of units. We also need to make sure that we're covering all other uh, areas of housing as well. But the biggest bang we're going to get for our buck is going to be with preserving the existing affordable housing that we have and creating situations where we're actually taking units that are in the general market and taking them out through cooperative ownership through uh, community land trust issues, and to those other types of things. So we make it sure that these units stay permanent and they're not susceptible to market swings. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Hodges, same question to you. Well, if you want to see what my proposals are for how we need to uh, deal with affordable housing issues moving forward, one great place to look is the budget I just proposed for 2018, as well as the budgets I've proposed in my time as mayor. Because the imagination we need is not simply to build more affordable housing units, though we need to do that. We are losing more units uh, than we can build. In the last 10 years, we have lost 11,000 units. We have built about, or created about 10,000. And so I've also invested in a naturally occurring affordable housing strategy, meaning how can we keep units that are currently affordable, how can we keep them affordable over time by giving supports and assistance to owners, among other strategies. And I've invested in that this year for the first time, and I propose we continue to invest in that next year. But we also need to provide support to renters and people who are facing evictions. One of the reasons we have some of the churn and the instability that we have is because there are people who are making money off of evicting people. And uh, you know there was a very damning study, and so we, I have invested in this budget to make sure that we are providing supports to renters and doing, of course, what we can uh, from our official standpoint and a regulatory standpoint to make sure that people, that renters' rights are protected, but I invest in that. And I've invested in a housing stability specialist, somebody who can make sure that we have housing policy that is about creating stability, uh, fighting displacement, which people also call gentrification, because as people, in, as we invest in neighborhoods that we think are so great, we make it harder for people to stay there who've made the neighborhood so great. So I've invested in that. And I suggest you take a look at my most recent budget speech, because in that speech, there's a, a whole section on just these issues. Okay, thank you very much, Mayor Hodges. Uh, Tom Hoke, what's your uh, strategy for affordable housing? Thank you. Well, the notion of affordable housing can't be separated from the lack of availability of jobs for everyone in our community. 
we fail to have an inclusive economy, and that's what we need to drive towards. So we don't have a plan right now to build that inclusive economy into the future. Oh, we have jobs. We have jobs, but right now we have a mismatch between those jobs and the individuals who really need them. We need to create pathways to those jobs, but looking down the road, we need to build the kinds of jobs that will serve our community and create the kind of inclusive economy that we really need. Now, until we get there, there are some things that we need to do, certainly with our public housing authority. Now, I know a little bit about that, and I can tell you right now it's $127 million in arrears in terms of the capital improvements that it needs. Now, let's think about that. We have 42 high-rises around the city of Minneapolis. What do we do if those buildings become uninhabitable? Do we just board them up? Oh, great. So now we have the huge moral issue of individuals who are low-income seniors and disabled people being tossed out onto the street, but now we have a community development issue. So my highest priority will be to ensure that we preserve that level of housing that we have right now. I will also work with foreign nonprofit developers, and I have a variety of strategies to help us create additional housing. But the other thing we really need to do is I'm, we I'm need Mr. to enroll Mr. more people. Uh, thank you. you. That, uh, that was about a minute and a half, so we're get, uh, we'll go next to Al Flowers. Thank you. This is a subject near and dear to my heart. And when they talk about employment opportunities, I always bring up Senator Hayden uh, and Senator Champion who put in uh, equity to get employment and training opportunities, but we need more uh, training uh, to get these jobs done. The state of Minnesota has 90,000 jobs that's not filled because uh, people don't have the training and we need to uh, work on that. So the job opportunity is there. With affordable housing, it's got to be a priority. The first thing I would do is revamp CPED. CPED is uh, the organization that usually deals with housing. I would, I would, I would deal with Chuck Lux, who's been in the city forever, uh, and, and bring in people that's going to have the vision that we have if you want real affordable housing. If you, but the key to that is home ownership and creating wealth creation. So we got to uh, figure out is, if this is a priority. They can say it uh, today. They can say anything today. But are they, is this a priority of the city, which it should be with over 60-some uh, percent of young kids in the African-American community uh, homeless? Uh, these uh, babies are out. On, these young kids are out on the street. So we got to uh, really be factual and say what we're going to do. I got some plans. If you look, uh, I got literature out in, in the back, and I got it wrote down. I got a housing plan that's wrote down. It's on the website, Truth to the People, that will really benefit uh, the people that we're talking about, trying to make everybody stay and make Minneapolis one at one time. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. Flowers. Uh, Jacob Fry. So I'm proud to have authored the amendment to the mayor's budget that brought our affordable housing trust fund to a record level of ten and a half million dollars. But I'm, I'm not going to brag about it because it is not anywhere close to enough. Uh, we have a whole lot more we need to be doing in our city. And I'm going to give you some specifics as to what what's needs to happen. Right now, when we offer a, a, a developer a subsidy to build affordable housing, it comes along with the requirement that it remain affordable for a certain number of years. Usually that's 15 or 20. But then after that 15 or 20 is up, it can be flipped back to market rate. So we're on this constantly revolving treadmill of trying to produce more affordable housing while we're losing that which we have, and we're falling behind. So at the end of the day, no matter how you break it down, yes, we do need a consistent pot of funding that's not competing with some of your classic city issues like fire and cops and streets to make sure that everybody can live in our great city. And here's what I want to do. I want to use a, a value capture model that, that takes uh, the increases or gains in value and takes a percentage of that gain. So let's say you have a property that's valued at 300,000 now, it'll be valued at 360,000 in several years. You take a percentage of, of that increase in value, you pull it off to the side, uh, and you say, you know what, we value affordable housing, we value living amongst different socioeconomic backgrounds, we're gonna put our money where our mouth is and we're gonna do this. And if you run the money out, if you run the numbers out on this, we can actually solve the crisis, even in a time when we're losing money from the state and federal legislatures. We can, uh, we can solve this crisis, we just need to be working collectively, and I wanna give a big thank you to Beacon Interfaith because they've been doing exactly that. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Fry. Nakima Levy Pounds. Can I ask you a question? If, if this is so solvable, why haven't we solved it? You've been in office. Why haven't you solved the problem? Are we going to wait another four years? You want me to answer that? Yeah, I do. I would like for you to answer that. Yeah. 
why, why, don't, why, don't you, why don't you both answer it? Uh, keep it, but keep it real short, uh, Councilmember Fry. What's your I'm, answer? I'm happy. I'm happy to answer that. You know what? With this crisis, this is not one jurisdiction that allows you to do all of it. You've got to be working with Hennepin, Ramsey, Bloomington, Edina. Right now, I represent the third ward of Minneapolis, and I'm proud to say in the third ward of Minneapolis, Mr. Hope, that we have done it. We're putting in housing for people at 50% of area median income for seniors. In North Loop, we've got housing that's going to be going in for people on a felony record at 30% of area median income. On the east side of the river, we're going to be working with City of Lakes Community Land Trust to make sure that we've got housing that's going in ultimately for ownership. So in the third ward, I'll tell you what, we've put in more housing than almost ever before for a middle and upper income area, especially that's always white. So yes, we have done it. But we need to be doing it in the entire city. We don't want to be congregating all the Great. housing in North Minneapolis. We want it all throughout. I agree. Yeah, you didn't answer what's the median income you're talking about, Jake. Yeah, well, what's the median income? If, if you're going to speak, speak okay. into a microphone. Um, but okay. let, let, let's keep it moving along. Let uh, Nakima Levy Pounds answer that first yeah, question. No, I'm glad that we have a nice, spirited debate going on. <laughs> <laughs> That's not Minnesota nice. So, I mean, that deserves an applause. That's wonderful. <laughs> I think that one of the most important ways to address the affordable housing crisis is to make sure that the political will is there to do so. So our city has studied the issue of inclusionary zoning or inclusionary housing for a very long time, and yet we still do not have a city ordinance that mandates inclusionary zoning, right? So we're not treating all developers equally. And with the amount of developer money that has come into this mayoral race, that's something that we need to be concerned about because talk is cheap. But after November, we will know who at the end of the day is most important in our city. Is it the people or is it profits? And so far it's been profits, especially when you think about the families who are, are struggling to have um, housing within their communities. So one of the things that we need to do is to look at our zoning codes. We need to rezone to ensure that there are more multifamily housing units available throughout the city. So if people want to build duplexes or apartments, that that option is available in some aspects of our city. We also need to revamp our home ownership programs um, in terms of all of the lots, the empty lots that the city has available. Number one, when you look at those, the empty lots that are available, the question is, why? How did the city capture that much land? What is the goal? Is the goal gentrification or is the goal to ensure that people of color, poor people, the working poor, have access to that land so that they can build homes and build wealth? Okay. That has not been a priority for the city. We need a paradigm shift with a program such as that one. Uh, thank you, Ms. levy Pounds. Um, and uh, lastly, for this first round, um, Aswar Rahman. Yeah, so I always have this feeling that I'm being talked about up here because I was a family growing up in poverty. I was the child they're speaking about. We are the household that if my family came to Minneapolis now, in 2015, we simply could not afford to live here. And at the beginning of the campaign, I used to think, why is that the case? Why does it seem like there's not that much progress happening? And after 10 months of campaigning, I can tell you, I know exactly why progress isn't happening in Minneapolis. We talk about throwing more money at it as if, you know, that'll be the solution by itself. We don't talk about stabilizing the amount of cost that we are passing on as a city to every single resident. And what I'm talking about here is property taxes. So under Mayor Hodges, we have seen a record growth in the amount it costs simply to stay in your home simply to live in the exact same space without any increase in services, without any increase in anything, but because our city seems, uh, I was, was going to use the H word, but I'm not going to do that here. Um, because our city seems very eager to gentrify, it's, we raise the property tax to the rate of about 20% in four years. So right now to live in your current residence in four years, it has gotten that much more expensive. I think that's unacceptable, and if we're going to pretend like this is something that's inevitable, we just have to look at how previous mayors have done it. So Mayor Ryback had a responsibility. He understood that he had a responsibility to not pass on the expenses of a mismanaged city government to the people who live in it. He worked year after year to keep that number as close to zero as possible, the growth in the pro uh, property tax levy. So I'm saying when we look at why it is that this city's gotten so unaffordable recently, we have to trace it back to the mayor's office because that honestly is where it started. Uh, Mr. Rockman, thank you very much. We, all, we, have, we have a lot of questions to get through, so I'm going I'm to get a little more aggressive about the time limits here. Um, so now we're going to the second round of questions. This is going to go first to Mayor Hodges. Um, and this is a kind of has an interesting push and pull to it because, as I think we've referenced up here, Minneapolis is growing. 
uh, both its population, its tax base, six straight year of more than a billion dollars in building in the city. You've got old buildings that are getting renovated, which is good. But those upgrades can also bring with them higher rents. So what, if anything, should Minneapolis do to make sure that low-income people and people of color aren't displaced by this influx of residents and upscale housing? Well, that issue of displacement is a huge one. People call it gentrification, but to me that's not a precise enough term. Displacement, people who helped make the neighborhood great can no longer afford to live in the neighborhood because everybody's figured out how great it is and they are flocking there. And so this budget, and again, I refer you to the speech I gave in, uh, a couple weeks ago, this budget invests heavily in making sure that we are ahead of the curve on displacement. Again, the housing stability specialist. Again, the naturally occurring affordable housing strategy, giving support to people so they can stay in their homes. The renter support. Um, we're doing a land banking pilot, making sure that we uh, can retain land and work with community trusts and other models uh, so that the, the land in these places stays affordable over time and, we, and, and we, are, we can keep up with that over time. And that includes a commercial displacement pilot. In other words, it's not just homeowners who are displaced, it's business owners who've helped to make the neighborhood great and they get displaced because their rents are going up. And so I propose investment in a commercial pilot as well to support them and yes through our uh, comprehensive plan we are talking about inclusionary zoning are there incentives we can create so that affordable housing is created in all the development that happens in the city not just ones that are deemed affordable housing it is amazing that we are growing it is a good thing but it is not a good thing if it starts to displace people in Minneapolis who made the city great and can no longer stay in the city and I will say doing this and doing this right as the mayor you have to know how the tax levy works so if anybody wants to know how the tax levy works if it doesn't come up tonight come ask me and I can tell you okay thanks mayor Hodges um, so Curtis you said we could jump in yeah, real quick. Yeah, I just want to point out something that mayor Hodges just said you said we've been talking about inclusionary zoning and inclusionary housing why are we still at the talking phase when the research has already been done well that I know that I have partners, Councilmember Bender is here, there are partners on the City Council who support inclusionary zoning, and I think this term we could have gotten it done, except there is a majority of folks on the City Council who, for whom they don't want to touch the conversation, or we know at this point that they would not support an inclusionary zoning policy. Uh, that's been true with a lot of work that we've tried to do. I've been able to get a lot of things over the finish line, but sometimes it's like I'm carrying a 100-pound bag of rocks on my back. I get across the finish line, but it takes a lot longer and a lot more work than it should to get something like that across the finish line. So we are doing it, making sh you know, because through the comp planning process, that is a community process. And so that's the, p the place where the community voices can weigh in. People are eager to have this. And once we can show that support, I think it'll be easier to get the city council to sign on. Uh, Tom Hoke, uh, wh where do you, how do you strike this balance between encouraging investment and not losing housing that was once affordable to Absolutely. Well, well, the displacement of individuals through development is a problem, and we need to address that because we certainly want to respect and include individuals who have lived in the community. So whenever development is happening in a neighborhood, we need to ensure that the individuals who are going to be affected have a seat at the table that it's really the, the kind of development that happens is inclusionary. I want to go back a little bit to the inclusionary zoning conversation that's happening because there is, a, there is a little bit of a myth out there that that solves every issue. So let's say that uh, we require a developer who's developing 20 units to, to, or 25 units to make five of them affordable. Now the question becomes how do you pay for that, okay? The, the notion is, well, the, the, the developer will just have to pay for it. That's how it works. But that isn't, isn't actually how it works. What happens is that that cost gets shifted to other individuals who would purchase the units. Now, that may be okay. It may be just fine. But if we're thinking about affordability at a number of levels, it may actually help make those units, those other units, less affordable. So I think we just have to be really careful about how we think about those issues. But as we go forward, as a city, and Nakima has talked about all the lots on the near north side, we really need to have targeted programs that work, work to, to um, facilitate the ownership 
of, of those lots, housing on those lots by the individuals who have been there for years. But I will say once again, we need to ensure that we have an inclusive economy because we want to make sure that we, this isn't just a one-off kind of thing, that we are building the kind of economy that really supports individuals so that they can make decisions about where and how they want to live, they can have stable households and stable families. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Uh, Al Flowers? Uh, I said at the beginning, truth to the people, and you know, and, and, and when you talk about displacement, uh, uh, Tom, I see Tom talking about the home and consent degree that uh, put many uh, African American family out. Uh, they didn't have they didn't have a plan for them when they put them uh, out of the projects when they moved and did that development and gave McCormick Barron a 99 year lease out of St. Louis. So when he uh, talks about that, I'm talking about uh, telling the truth. I said that about earlier about the medium income. I, I understand what uh, Jacob is saying. What is that medium income? And we got to be uh, truthful and honest uh, with what's been happening. I hear Amwar talking about uh, Mayor Ryback. He was a part of the problem. He uh, a part of the problem on uh, housing and what they did. And when they put the plans together to put them out for uh, uh, people to afford, they didn't do what they said they were gonna do. That's why I said it wasn't a priority. Homeless, they had the 10 year plan on homelessness. It wasn't a priority. We have to really, if you want this city to change, the people that's not here tonight, the people that's laying out on the street, the, the youth, the homeless youth, that's gonna be the future. We have to change things. We have to start talking about building youth facilities that uh, uh, young kids can go in, efficiency housing. We gotta get those young people off the street. So I, will, I hope these candidates, while they go going giving cross uh, questions that we can't get the answer to tonight, but uh, would uh, speak the truth about how we're gonna get to get kids, young people, and get people to be able to afford housing. I said put a linkage fee. I've talked to groups and that we said put a linkage fee on every development that comes in the city of Minneapolis. Let's oh. put a linkage fee on them developers and okay. see what they do then and see what how we can uh, fight against the development because that's what they can build a twin stadium, they can build a football stadium, but thank, when you're talking you, about Flower. building something for youth, you can't build it. Is, is it my time already? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost two minutes. That's, that's okay. Everyone's been going over, so I'm trying to, trying to be fair here. Jacob Fry? Yeah, so first, we have to understand what the term gentrification means, or at the very least, define it, because everybody has a different notion. Uh, I, I believe that gentrification is the, the displacement of, of both communities and cultures that have made these neighborhoods wonderful to begin with. And yes, we do need to push back on that. And I'll give you three things that we want to be working on. First, yes, naturally occurring affordable housing, or NOAA, is very important. That being said, as soon as you subsidize NOAA, it's no longer naturally occurring. So in other words, you put a subsidy in, then it's happening because of government and, and, and rather than just happening naturally. A uh, second is when we build affordable housing, it's got to be more than just housing at 50 and 60 percent of area median income. So right now, and I'll try to explain this as best as I can, right now we, we, we bind everything to what is the area median income. So someone, something that is affordable for someone making 50 and 60 percent of area median income is great. But we also need that deeper affordable housing as well, 30%, 20%, 40%, because we want people to have that next rung on the ladder to be able to lift themselves out of homelessness. And the final thing is, is we do have a, a supply and demand issue. It is an awesome thing that people really want to live in our city. People are coming in from the suburbs. They're coming in from other, other cities. They're, they're, they're even coming in from the, the outskirts of, of Minneapolis. Now, as we have that demand, we don't have the supply right now to fill it. So when you have these underutilized parcels, yes, we do need to grow the city. We do need to provide more housing generally to offset that demand. It is extremely high. And I'm proud to say in the third ward, we haven't just talked about it. We've actually done it. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Fry. Uh, Nakima Levy-Pounds? Well, I think that we can look to places like Adina, Golden Valley, St. Louis Park, and even Detroit, where they are requiring um, a certain level of um, housing, affordable housing, in market rate developments. And a big part of that has to do with the fact that we have not made that a priority in the city of Minneapolis. We should be leading those types of efforts instead of making excuses about why we will not pass an inclusionary zoning policy and why we won't uh, pass a, a policy focused on comprehensive mixed income development. So that is one of the things that I think is going to be important. In terms of gentrification, 
we need to recognize that people of color are going to be pushed out of the city of Minneapolis unless there is leadership that stands up against that. And part of how you stand up against that is making sure that the public is informed about gentrification. That is a word that people don't want to say. I think displacement is a softer word. But the reality is gentrification will happen. And so in order to prevent gentrification, one of the things that we need to do is hone in on those areas of the city where um, there's concentrated areas of poverty and uh, rents are rapidly rising. And we need to uh, address the issues with the, the um, companies that own those particular developments and talk about the need to um, provide resources so that rehabilitation efforts are less expensive, which can help curb rising rent costs. So that is one example of what can happen. But if we don't have people of color at the okay. table as part of the decision making, they will be pushed out of the city. That's just the bottom line. Thanks, Nikima Levy Town. Uh, Aswar Rahman. The words we use matter very much. And I just witnessed something very scary happen up here, except with the exception of Dr. Levy Pounds. Everyone was perfectly comfortable with using the word displacement, where we truly mean gentrification. Let me ask you this. Has a single luxury apartment been displaced by a single unit of affordable housing in the city of Minneapolis? No. So therefore, it's gentrification. It is wealth displacing poverty. It's a very one-way street. And therefore, we should call it what it is. Because the moment we start calling gentrification simply displacement, a very neutral term, like Dr. Levy Pounds pointed out, here's the kind of things we start doing. We start basically creating luxury apartments and waiting. And Jacob Fry touched on this too. We create contracts where basically the affordability clause expires after X number of years. So basically, we overinvest in these so-called affordable housing units. And in fact, if you want to look at specifics, a very recent development in downtown Minneapolis that was intended for homeless young adults cost more than five times per unit what it would have cost on the market. So basically, we're making these really comfortable agreements with developers who are trying to get as much public funding as possible, except a few years down the road, those units are not going to be in anywhere close to affordable housing. And it starts with a city that is led by people who are comfortable with calling gentrification displacement. Thank you very much, Aswar Rahman. Lastly, we'll hear from Raymond Dean. So we know that there are parts of our city where the land values are low, and investors look at those as opportunities to create profits. Uh, there are parts of our city that have a tremendous amount of naturally occurring affordable apartments, and we have outside investors that are coming in and they are buying those apartment buildings, and they are evicting the individuals that live there. I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. I've stood with the people in Whittier who march to the offices of Nexus to say what you're doing to us is wrong. These are individuals that have lived in their units for 20 to 30 years. And one developer has come in and bought the project and they've decided that they are going to evict these people uh, by increasing the rents drastically. And we have a lot of individuals that are afraid. Some of these individuals that they're displacing are our non-documented neighbors. They don't feel like they have any rights. I think as an elected official, we have a responsibility to stand there with them and to fight with them, to fight back hard. Those aren't specifics. Some specific things that we can do, we can put in place just cause eviction so that they can't do these types of things. They actually have a reason to in evict someone versus just wanting to make profits. We can look at first right of purchase. So individuals that have the opportunity to buy their building, to come together as a co-op or to work with uh, community land trusts. And lastly, we need to do rent stabilization. We need to make it so that landowners and apartment uh, property owners can't come in and increase rents four, five, six hundred dollars a month on a six or a seven hundred dollar unit. And that's not going to be an easy fight. We're going to have to fight hard to make that happen. Thanks, Representative Dean. Um, and that uh, ends that uh, round of questions. Um, we're running a bit behind. 
Um, so I'm going to have one more question for everyone up here, and it's something that um, Raymond Dean just brought up a little bit, which is the landlord side of this equation and kind of the flip of gentrification, which is underinvestment in properties. They're a property that hasn't gotten the amount of investment that it needs. And this question is going to go first to Tom Hoke. Uh, Minneapolis has been getting tough on landlords. It says consistently fail to properly maintain their properties, in some cases stripping them of their rental licenses. What more should the city be doing to protect tenants who complain about maintenance, proper, uh, maintenance problems uh, to protect them from retaliation? Tom Hope. It's a good question. It's a real problem in a very tight rental market. And so, you know, ultimately, as we are growing our city, we have got to get into the pipeline more housing. I mean, that is critical because until we do that, we leave landlords very much in charge. The other thing we can do, though, is to ensure that we are working with tenants and landlords when necessary to make sure that the housing that they live in is affordable. Now, I would propose that we continue to support organizations like Homeline that actually educate tenants in advance, help them understand what their rights are, and then help prosecute those landlords who are failing to live up to their responsibilities. They also have an education program, by the way, for landlords to make sure that those landlords know what their responsibilities are. But when the landlord refuses to follow through, the city needs to be front and center with that tenant to make sure that they get the resolution to their claim and support them in their, their rent withholding or whatever it is to make sure that those um, units are, are habitable. It's hard to do until we get more units, though, in the pipeline. So that's going to continue to be a problem because landlords are going to continue to be in charge. So more housing sooner is long term how we're going to help alleviate a lot of that problem. Thank you, Mr. Hoke. Al Flowers? Seemed like that lightning coming in here on them. <laughs> That's actually uh, to cut you guys off when you go over time. <laughs> no, trying something new. <laughs> uh, no, uh, this this is a major problem, and um, and I I watched as um, I seen a family, a father who lost his six kids in uh, unhabitable housing uh, in North Minneapolis. I seen a mother lost uh, three of her babies burned to death uh, in in this kind of housing and. And that's why I say this, this time it, it has to be a priority and, and we have to uh, uh, bring these uh, things together and hold uh, landlords accountable. But we, we get, first got to get people out of the, some of the despair that they're in. And I'm glad they said don't say displace, say gentrification. I like uh, Anzwar saying that because that's what it is. And, and some people, you got to understand, some people have to have that housing. Some people, that we have so many homeless people, some people don't uh, go. When they go and look in these houses and the heat not working and they, they just trying to put something over here. We got young youth that's uh, uh, staying in trap houses that nobody knows about. And so that's why I say to the audience, I just want you to listen to the campaign. Listen to about the truth of what's going on because even after November the 7th, we still can hold whoever, whether it's me, whoever it is, we still can hold the mayor and the city council accountable and make them do the things that they should do. And affordable housing should be a top priority, uh, making home uh, uh, homeowners, creating wealth in all communities should be a top priority. Put it on the top. Put the developers down for four years. Put them down and say, we're going to charge you a linkage fee. Whenever you develop over 100 square feet, this was talked to just not by me, but other people in the community. We all worked on this together, white, black, whatever uh, color you is, we all work together on this plan. And it's out there on that front desk. Thank, Pick thank, it up thank, thank and you, go to the website, yep. Truth to the People. Thank you, Mr. Flowers. Uh, Jacob Fry. So uh, over the last few years, I'm proud to have chaired the subcommittee that has uh, taken away, I, I believe, and I might be wrong, I believe it's a record number of, of landlords' licenses that were operating in, in a fashion that was having people live in totally unhabitable conditions. Uh, and now the problem is, is that when you take their license away, it doesn't simply get rid of the problem. The, the, the home can be sold, uh, the prices can be jacked up, they can put granite countertops in, and then the place that was previously affordable but unhabitable is now habitable but unaffordable. Uh, now at the city level, we can be pushing back on it, but here's the problem that we're confronting right now is over half of our city, over half of our city rents. and. About, we have about a 1% to a 2% vacancy rate, rate right now. That's the problem. 
And because our vacancy rate is so low, the prices continue to get jacked up through the roof and the people that made these communities wonderful to begin with are getting displaced. That's where the city comes in. That's where we need to put our money where our mouth is. I discussed the previous plan that would ultimately help and we need to be going in that direction. And finally, I'll just say this. Uh, we also need pro bono lawyers. The city needs to be working with pro bono housing attorneys on a constant basis to make sure that people who are challenging a landlord or a developer that is not properly keeping the conditions in a, in a, habitable, in a habitable light, uh, that, that their uh, feet are held to the fire. Thank you, Council Member Farrell. Nikima Levy Pounds, and uh, remember this question is, you know, what to do to protect the tenants who complain about pro maintenance problems at their property. <laughs> at the properties That's they live in. I just thought I'd bring it back to the original way question. That. <laughs> so, um, so what to do to protect tenants when there are maintenance problems? Yeah, yeah, they, so that they're not afraid of retaliation. What more should the city Well, do? I think that part of why they, t um, tenants are afraid of retaliation is because we haven't done enough to hold landlords accountable. We need to overhaul um, our renter licensing system, and we need better coordination between, land, between uh, the police, regulatory services, and the courts to make sure that problem landlords don't slip through the cracks. Beyond that, we need uh, more culturally proficient um, inspectors, housing inspectors, because uh, we have such a level, high level of diversity in the city of Minneapolis, people who speak many different languages, the inspectors don't always reflect that. And so people, first of all, might be fearful, especially if they're undocumented, um, of reporting problem landlords. And we need to respond to that by, number one, reiterating that we're a sanctuary city. But beyond that, making sure that we reflect that in terms of who we hire and making sure that, that we have a listening ear at the city and that we do follow through on holding landlords accountable. Beyond that, I would look at the Corcoran uh, Neighborhood Association's um, um, uh, document that they put together, their guide for renters, where they teach renters about their rights. I think that we need to replicate uh, that particular initiative. It's really powerful and insightful. Um, and one last thing I'll say, Jacob Fry referenced Quickly. earlier the fact that uh, we need pro, pro bono lawyers. Well, pro bono lawyers are only as good as state law is concerned. When you review state law, state law is not in support of renters. And so that means that as a city, we are going to have to be more active at the legislature advocating um, for a change to our laws and our policies and strengthen the rights of renters. I think that's an important role for the city to play. Thank you, Nikima Levy Pounds. And uh, Aswar Rahman, yeah, protecting so renters. Again, with almost every major issue that affects the city, this is something that personally affects me. So that store I was talking about, my mother's store, is very small. It's like 30 feet by 10 feet. And uh, it was owned, we didn't know this at the time, but it was the building was owned by a slumlord. That's what every single one of our fellow tenants called him. He was a slumlord. And Sure enough, the contract that he got my mother to sign was awful. We just didn't know it because we didn't know the fine, the legal details of it. So when Jacob Fry talks about expanding pro bono services, absolutely. That's where it starts. We need to have municipal legal clinics that expand and uh, basically support the existing legal clinics in the city of Minneapolis. And if we need more locations, more hours, the city should be taking the lead in making sure every single person in the city of Minneapolis has access to these legal services when it comes to tenants' rights. With, even if we had the right level of legal support, we still wouldn't be able to do anything about him because he was certified at the highest possible level by the city. And according to the Star Tribune from an article just a few, uh, I think it was a few months ago now, that is not uncommon in the city of Minneapolis. Our inspection services need some serious reform because now we have inspectors going into some of the worst buildings owned by some of the worst slumlords and they end up giving them the highest possible rating. I think the way to reform that, and this is significant reform, is double certification. I know it requires more resources, more services, but we need to make sure that a second pair of eyes goes through the exact same scenario that was presented in the first one to make sure that we don't have any room for corruption, that we don't have any room for laziness because ultimately who is hurt? The tenant, especially the low income tenant. Thank you, Azra Rahman. Uh, Representative Dean. <clears throat> so, landlords pay a fee for every unit they have. I've talked to some landlords. They actually think it's, it's kind of easy to pay that fee. So we can increase that fee to create more inspectors. Uh, ultimately, more inspectors are going to help alleviate some of the issues of individuals who are not maintaining good living conditions for people that live in their units. And I would say the city needs to go a little bit farther. I would say that the city needs to put in place a rental ombudsman that can actually deal with these type of 
systems, specifically when a renter is at a place where they're being, I would say in many ways, taken advantage by their landlord, that they feel safe. And they have someone that's actually in a place willing to help mediate the situation between the landlord. And sometimes that may include holding rents in escrow and other types of things to make sure that those units are brought up to the standards necessary for people to live a dignified life in the city of Minneapolis. Thank you, Representative Dean. And lastly, we'll hear from Mayor Hunt. Well, I have been a renter in the city of Minneapolis, and I was a renter uh, in the city of Minneapolis for a number of years while I was on the city council. And so the conversations we have in the city about renters and how important they are, um, I could feel sometimes what comes at renters from homeowners, and I could also feel sometimes uh, some of the uh, instability that a renter faces in the city. And that's one of the reasons that I've made the investments in the budget that I have made this year, having had those experiences, that uh, I did put significant amount of money in the budget for 2018 for renter support for just these reasons. Yes, support for the tenant hotline and making sure people had a number that they can call if they're experiencing trouble, but also legal support for tenants and for renters when they are facing legal issues that they have somewhere they can go that that is safe and also the housing stability coordinator uh, who can oversee and, and partner with and collaborate and make sure that the entire enterprise and the entire city is there creating stability, including and especially for renters. I don't call it a rental ombudsperson, but there is, it's a cousin of that work, and I think that that, that, um, uh, that, that could be something that we could look at more specifically moving forward. Um, and we have, I have invested in more inspectors and more housing inspectors for just this reason, <clears throat> to make sure that we can stay on top of and keep track of landlords who are not doing right by their tenants, who are not doing right by the residents of Minneapolis and by the city of Minneapolis. And I do that because I can see that that level of instability moving forward, we're gonna get more gentrification and displacement if we are not serving our renters well. Thank you, Mayor Hodges. Um, the organizers of this event um, did a lot of work to uh, research some of your the candidates' past statements around affordable housing, and they kind of crafted a, a question around uh, for each candidate uh, to that effect. And I want to make sure, because they put all that work into that, that we get to those. Um, so this will uh, each, you won't all be answering the same question. Everyone gets their own question this round. Does that make sense? Uh, and we're going to start with Al Flowers. Uh, Al, uh, here's what they wrote for you. Um, now, Flores, one of the items you propose for the city in your housing policy and funding platform is an affordable home ownership fund, which will be funded via a property tax levy. How would you convince residents and city council members to support that tax levy? Well, I, I think uh, this is the time. A little closer to the mic, maybe. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think this is the time that what we are talking about now, about uh, affordable housing <laughs> and making things happen. I like when the uh, people already in the elected office talk about the budget, and then when it, when it comes down to it, that it could be cut at the last minute, the council can cut it, or whether you're at the ledger, they could cut that. So, but I, it's the truth, that's uh, speaking the truth of what I'm talking about uh, uh, on here, that we gotta work together. We have to work together. I believe the citizens of Minneapolis, I know they, they all over want it to be whole. And if, if we don't do the plan I'm talking about, which I've worked on with several organizations uh, that uh, high profile in housing, if, I, if we would work on that uh, together, I would put Chuck Lux, like I said, been in City uh, Hall, we would uh, re, uh, scrap CPED and switch, and switch it all around and make it all about affordable housing, homelessness, uh, creating youth shelters and things like that. Uh, that's how I convince them because I know they want to help those people, what we are up here talking about today. Okay. Uh, just with uh, true honesty, uh, for one thing, uh, that's all I got here, truth okay. to the people. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to hear next from Jacob Fry. Uh, Councilmember Fry, here's the question they have for you. Uh, Councilmember Fry, you've suggested capturing a percentage of tax revenue from increases in certain properties valued over $300,000 or more. You mentioned that earlier tonight. Um, how would that work, and how would you keep that from slowing down development? Well, it's a good question. So here's specifically how it would work. Uh, let's say you have a home that is valued at, at $400,000, and that particular parcel is included within the framework. 
Uh, and let's say that six years later, it's valued at $470,000. That $70,000 of additional uh, value results in new tax revenue. It's not a new tax. It's just value that we don't yet have. And if you were to pool a percentage of that increase in revenue that you get from the increase in value, say 30%, and you were to put it off to the side so it doesn't compete with some of your classic city issues. And then even better if we're able to work with some of these surrounding jurisdictions, Hennepin, Bloomington, Medina, Ramsey, et cetera, then we actually would have the money to be able to do this. Is it gonna be controversial? Absolutely, it will be. But it's the right thing to do because if we're really gonna solve the crisis in the face of losing 4% and 9% low-income tax credits, which by the way, some of them we're losing, if we're, Donald Trump is really gonna cut out community development block grants, which by the way, they're talking about it, then we the city need to step up to be that beacon of opportunity and inclusivity for every single person in our city. We can do that. Thank you, Council Member Frey. Excuse uh, me, Curtis, can I just break in for a oh, second? Oh, sure, absolutely. Because what he just described is the tax levy. I mean, what we do as a city is if there's an increase in value, the city coffers don't automatically get that increase in value. You have to propose a number that's higher uh, if you want more property tax revenue from year to year. And the way the property tax works is if your value, if your property is valued at a higher level, then you are going to pay more property taxes. Nothing stops the city from investing uh, what goes into the general fund into affordable housing. And as a matter of fact, much of, many of the dollars that I have proposed for affordable housing come out of the general fund and have captured the growth in our property in the last few years. And that's not what entirely correct. Is that, what it means that's that's is that, not entirely correct. What it means is that you can actually increase taxes, but because the, the properties are valued more and there are more of them, it doesn't, people don't experience it as the kind of increase that Aswar asserts, but that is not how the property tax levy works either. Uh, Council Member well, Fry, just quick response and then we'll go Quick to response. When you increase the tax levy, that money goes into the general fund that could be used for anything. And this is where the rubber really meets the road. The question is, what are you going to use those dollars for? And I'm saying I value affordable housing. There are other benevolent things that this money can go to. But I'm saying I, develop, I value affordable housing and we as a city should make the commitment ahead of time. Okay, that well, this is where the money is going to go. So no, Mayor Hodges, you increase the ha tax levy, it doesn't go into a separate pool that is in separate in and of it to itself. That's just not how it works. It goes to the general fund. Right, and that's what I said. It goes into the general okay. fund. But what I would note, Curtis, is that um, in the three budgets that I presented that the council has voted for, Councilmember Fry noted that he had made one amendment to the budget, and that is the only amendment to the budget that he's made of any significance in the time. He has taken my lead on the budget and how to invest in the budget. I worked with him and was proud to support his amendment to add more money to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. But he has, as the question came earlier, he has been in office for the last almost four years now, and this has not been what he's been doing. Looks like a lot of people want to get on this one. Oswar Rahman, why yeah, uh, and Al Flowers. I'll let somebody else talk. When we, when we look at this in such a cut and dry way, so basically because certain property values went up in the city of Minneapolis, we are going to raise the rate on every single person. Who does that hurt most? Does it hurt somebody who has disposable income or does it hurt low-income people? That's not that how the, the levy works, Aswar. It's that is how, how the levy works. works. Not how it what works. is a single measure you've taken to ensure that low-income people in Minneapolis will not suffer because of your property tax levy? Aswar. The way the property tax levy works is we decide an amount of money and then we spread it across all the properties that pay property taxes. And so, as a result, um, people whose properties are, are valued higher, who've increased in significant value, uh, they do pay a little bit more, but it's relative to the value of the housing and the, pro and the commercial properties near you and around you. Mayor, I a, prefer not a, to be condescended to. I asked you a, a simple question without a single answer coming out right now. I... Uh, uh, I, I don't know how to explain it more simply or more accurately. Name a single oh, measure okay, you've okay. taken. <laughs> it it is, wait, wait, it Al is, Flowers has been patiently waiting. He wanted to jump on this, and then let's move on because we have questions and, for and, each of you. And I'm not going to be long. You see, we already we're talking about affordable housing, but we're up to three and four hundred thousand dollars. I just want to want you to recognize the price. The, the, the price that went, the price that went up. It, it's went up while we sitting here, and and uh, and and some of the things that uh, uh, Council Member Pry just said. Uh, about where we can get resources if we really want to concentrate on affordable housing is in, uh, in the land and uh, the housing, everything they sell. And what's the priority when they go back to the general fund? 
how do we get it to make it usable uh, for some of the organizations that's really trying to do affordable housing and then listen to them? So that's uh, what I'm, but the price them went up as we sit in here today. Okay, so now we've got uh, seven candidates. We've got uh, individualized questions for each of you, so I'm going to move on here. Nikima Levy Pounds, um, your housing platform emphasizes enacting equal access initiatives and enforcing fair housing laws. What's an example of a fair housing law that Minneapolis could do a better job enforcing? Well, one of the things that um, I want to bring up is, some, is an, an issue that I was contacted by a resident on the north side about. So looking at the city's uh, program called the Minneapolis Buy, Build, and Rehab Program, there is an issue that several mothers, most of whom are women of color, have brought to city government and they, their concerns have, been, have fallen on deaf ears. So these women purchased homes in 2006 and 2009 from the same developer, same realtor who represented the buyer and the seller, not the interest of the buyer, they have inflated home prices that don't fit the north side demographics, 30-year interest-bearing terms, clauses on mortgages, where they can't rent out their home, even if they come across financial hardship. And they can't refinance due to upside down and underwater property values since year one. They feel like they are glorified renters and not true homeowners. They're forced with the only option to walk away from their homes and to file foreclosure. And they have been calling upon the city to assist them because they feel as though it was a bait and switch that has happened to them. They have not received relief. Instead of the city putting forward programs like this that are supposed to entice people to buy homes who are low income, they are setting the, the, the people up for failure. And part of the problem is that the city is now about to do it again through a similar program. Okay, um, I'm sorry, we gotta uh, keep moving here. Aswar Rahman. Um, one of your plans for improving the city's economy is to free up $70 million from the city's budget. What I'm sorry, Curtis. Oh, I'm I, sorry. I need to get an answer on behalf of these women about this initiative because it not only affects these working mothers, oh, I'm sorry. many of whom are single mothers who fell for what they feel is a bait and switch that the city offered, but the program is about to be offered by the city again which means that more potential homeowners, low-income homeowners, could be duped through this initiative. So I would like for Mayor Hodges and Council Member Fry to respond to what I just said about this program. Okay, uh, quickly, uh, keep your answers very short if you could. Uh, Mayor Hodges, go first. Which program are you referring to, Nakima? They said that it is called the Minneapolis Buy, Build, and Rehab Program, and they have come to City Hall, they have met with stakeholders, and they have asked for relief. Uh, I am happy to look into that and get back to you. What I do know is that we have invested in homeowner support and home ownership, um, that we are doing our best to make city land available for people to own homes or the homes that we partnered with Hennepin County to buy after the foreclosure crisis. Are those the homes that you're referring to? And what you're saying is that they have bought the homes, but they aren't being supported they're under, in the homes? They're underwater financially. They cannot rent out the homes when they face uh, financial challenges. They are stuck in those homes, and they feel like their only option is to walk away and um, let their homes go into foreclosure. And so the concern is if the city is saying that we care about affordable housing, we care about low-income people, we care about people of color, we have programs in place in which we have an opportunity to actually demonstrate that. And we have not done so according to these working mothers who are being impacted. So the information that I have about our homeownership assistance programs and our, and our programs and the homeowners that I've talked to myself personally, it's been a successful program. What I'm hearing from you is that there are people for whom it's not successful, and I am happy to take a look into that and make sure that we set it up well if and when we do it again. Council Member Fry, did you want to add anything? I don't have a lot to add, but... Okay. Um, well, then let's keep moving, because uh, I was in the middle of asking uh, so Rock my question. Is what, <laughs> this is what typically happens to residents when they are coming forward. And in all honesty, if oh. we're here talking about affordable housing, whether they answer this question or not, the problem is that when people in the city of Minneapolis who are low income and people of color come to City Hall and they bring concerns, their concerns specifically around this issue fall on deaf ears. That is what we need to end in the city of Minneapolis and be more responsive okay. to the people. Um, 
Uh, Aswar Rahman, um, so uh, we, uh, we were talking about one of your plans for improving the city's economy is to free up $70 million from the city's budget. Um, what affordable housing programs would you be able to keep when cutting that large amount of money out of the budget? Well, there we go. So that's $70 million, we all should know. That's only 5% of the budget. And if you looked at some of the things that the city spends money on, you would be infuriated. So basically, this year, we're going to spend $5 million on the Super Bowl, and it's the most optimistic paragraph I've ever read in a tax document. It basically is hoping that we get a money back from, from the Super Bowl. Uh, we're actually going to spend a lot more than that. We're going to spend $2 million on a website. I'm a web developer by profession. We are overpaying for that website five or six times. But here, the question was, how do we actually use that fund to good use? The first and biggest thing is if we were smart with how we invested our money, if we were smart with how we spend our civic funds, we wouldn't need to raise the property tax as much as we're talking about now. We could actually stabilize the cost of living significantly because when a landlord raises rent in the city of Minneapolis, they list three reasons. These are the three top reasons. Inflation, city can't do much about. Rise in demand, okay, maybe the city can do some things about it, but the third thing that is fully within the control of the mayor's office is a rise in property tax. So I'm saying with smarter investment, with smarter budgeting, we would not be in the place where we are right now. And instead, we are bending over backwards for large organizations. We're bending over backwards for the NFL. We'll bend over backwards for a lot of people, but we are, by doing that, making it significantly less affordable to live in the city of Minneapolis. Uh, Raymond Dean, uh, one of the ways that you propose the affordable housing trust fund uh, to increase the affordable housing trust fund is via municipal housing bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, how would that affect the city's debt burden, and how would you sell that to the city council, that idea? <clears throat> well, it would increase the city's debt burden, uh, but not in such a way that it would hurt the credit rating. Uh, we have a crisis, and we have to ask ourselves, are we going to make this a priority? And if we are going to make it a priority, then we need to secure the resources and the funding necessary to address it. If we're not going to do the things that are going to be hard, we're going to continue to have issues around affordable housing in the city of Minneapolis. So how I would sell it to the city council, um, I would ask them, do you value places for people to live in your ward? And if they do, they will get on board, and that will actually help with an economic boost in the city. <clears throat> because we know if people have stable housing, uh, and if they have an increase in wage, which is coming, they'll be spending money. And that spending money will help Minneapolis to continue to grow, just like many things we've done in the past few years at the state level that have allowed people to have money in their pockets to stimulate the economy and keep the state moving forward. Uh, Mayor Hodges, your platform mentions that you've invested $40 million in affordable housing in Minneapolis. What results have been achieved through those investments, and what's your strategy for future housing investments? And I have, in the past three years, proposed that investment for $40 million, and we've been doing that good work. And I've also had to innovate while we do that. Not all of it could go into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. When I had conversations in the community, uh, particularly the Somali community, the Latino community, uh, folks asked for housing for larger families because we have extended family we're living with, we have a lot of kids. And the Affordable Housing Trust Fund couldn't create incentives for units that had uh, two, three, four, five bedrooms uh, because of some caps we had placed on it. So I worked with many of the people in this room. We had the conversation about investing in the, large, in the family housing initiative. And right now, uh, because we invested in that, the state invested in that, we have units going up on 38th and Minnehaha. Thank you very much to Representative Dean for his partnership on that and that work. So that's some of what we've gotten. Uh, we're still gathering data on how the naturally occurring affordable housing program has gone this year. Um, but I was amused earlier when Councilmember Fry said, well, if you support people to stay in their homes, it's no longer naturally occurring affordable housing. Okay, we can call it something else. I just want it to be affordable and I want people to be able to stay in their homes. And that's what we're investing in. Um, and, and we have kept that. And then there's, uh, you know, there's numbers of new units that have been built. There's numbers of new units that have been preserved. There's numbers of people who have called into our tenant hotline. Uh, we've also been investing in the immigrant community uh, when they've been so under fire that there has been um, investments made to help shore up people in these legal times, okay. including around housing. So I could go on. But those investments in our housing, uh, they're important. They are necessary. They are not sufficient, which is why we have to have more innovation and creativity as we approach uh, the investment that's happening in Minneapolis, as people move back. We have 
have to have innovation and creativity, which is what I okay. propose this year and for next year. Thank you, Mayor Hodges. Uh, Tom Hoke, you've said Minneapolis should be a leader in the region for affordable housing and should be part of a metro-wide affordable housing initiative. What would that initiative look like, and what regional uh, housing policies would you propose metro mayors work on together? I think that's a great idea. Uh, my experience in the affordable housing industry is that it's nearly impossible to address this issue solely within the confines of the city of Minneapolis. And we actually don't need to because we also know that affordable housing is a statewide issue. So every tool that we have in our toolbox actually seems to relate back to property taxes. And so what we have to do is be careful that we don't just look to to our property tax base as the sole solution because when we levy additional taxes, what do we do? We make more housing less affordable. So we're sort of caught in a catch-22. So we need to expand the conversation. So we have to be in this together because we also know that what happens in, in Edina, St. Louis Park, Richfield with affordable housing has a has a direct impact on what happens inside the city of Minneapolis. 700 units in Richfield become market rate and suddenly we have 700 households who are desperately looking for housing. So unless you have a coordinated metro-wide approach to this, it's not going to happen. How are we going to do that? We're going to have to pool our resources and we're going to have to coordinate to make sure that when that happens, we're all at the table. So we have the resources there to purchase the property, for, exa for example, when it's about to go market rate. And we can pass the kinds of ordinances across the metro area that will enable us to do that. We're also okay. going to have to build relationships across the metro area so that we have a bigger, louder voice at the, sta at the state of Minnesota because nothing is clearer to me than that we simply cannot handle this on our own and we're going to have okay. to have bipartisan support at the state capitol to help us do this. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hope. So the, uh, those were the individualized questions. Um, now I have some bad news, which is that uh, we're getting very short on time. Um, that part of that's on me um, for not uh, being a stricter taskmaster on the timekeeping. Um, but what I would like to propose is that we skip closing statements so that we can get at least one audience question in. Or is, are the candidates okay with that? Yeah. Uh, we, we, you've probably given your closing statement about 100,000 times at this point. <laughs> Maybe a lot of these people have heard it. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, this is we're probably the only audience question we're going to have time for if we're going to try to end uh, close to 8 p.m. Um, and this audience member writes, nobody has mentioned rent control. Do you support rent control? Why or why not? And I believe we're starting with Jacob Fry on that. Well, it, first of all, it depends what you mean by rent control. If you're saying to stagnate the rents and prevent any property from increasing the rents, no, no, I'm against that. Um, and regardless, it's not a city issue, it's, it's a state issue. We have a state uh, statute right now that prohibits any form of rent control. Um, and, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you, there's usually when you see other cities or states that have implemented rent control, it has almost the exact opposite impact as is initially intended. One of two things happen. Either one, the quality of the conditions go dramatically down so that the property is not habitable. Um, or two, they say, you know what, the property's valued at $1,000 and we've got to cha charge $700. We're just not going to make it housing anymore. We're going to flip it to commercial. The supply goes down and ultimately the rents go up. Uh, so okay. I'll say it is a st if, if by rent control we're saying stagnate the rents, no, I, I'm against that and it is a state issue and I'm happy to, to talk with any of you as to why. Uh, Nikima Levy Pattons, rent control, good idea. Legal, yeah, legal I don't, uh, I don't need aside. to regurgitate what Jacob said. I thought that he gave a great explanation and also what is actually happening with regard to rent control. Um, in terms of whether I support rent control, I would need more information about whether or not that would be good for the city of Minneapolis. I have concerns about what has happened in other jurisdictions where they have had rent control. And as Jacob said, there's a problem with state law. So unless and until we get state law changed, we should not be making promises about rent control as candidates for mayor. Azra Rahman? Yeah, so it's a solid idea. The devil is always in the details. And the question is, who will benefit from rent control? And that usually comes down to who will be in the room when the finer details of rent control are settled. And I think if it's the kind of administration that's willing to call gentrification displacement, then we are in some trouble. In the long run, that will not be a good outcome for our city. 
Ultimately, what we need is a strengthening of tenants' rights, and some of that is financial. It's making sure that a landlord is not allowed to raise the rent above a certain amount. There is a lot of room for negotiation. I personally believe that everyone has rights to negotiate, and I think in this context, rent control is something we can consider in the future, but the devil is in the details. Pick the right leaders because they will be the ones who ultimately will have to make the decision. Raymond Dean? Rent is... <clears throat> impacted by what the state law says. That doesn't mean that the city shouldn't fight for those things for the residents. I've mentioned rent control. If you look at my affordable housing pro, uh, policy paper, it talks about rent control. Also, I was right. This is about renters' rights as well. And I would say, lastly, if we can't place some limit on landlords, I mean, for instance, in payday lending, the state, we allow you know, payday lenders to charge 300 and some odd percent on people. Uh, in the state of South Dakota, they restricted at 36 percent. Right now, we're at a situation where what's happening with rents is happening with payday lending, and I think we need to work with the state to put some limits on what landlords can do as far as increasing rents. Mayor Hodges? Well, I heard the applause when it was mentioned I hear the desperation for people wanting to make sure that as we grow and as we develop and as we become an even more uh, wonderful place for people to live, that we are not displacing the people who made it such a great place to live, that we don't experience gentrification. And I've talked a lot tonight about what some strategies are. There are more that we can put on the table, and I think we get to explore those before we take such a drastic measure on our housing market as doing rent control, uh, because, but, I hear and I understand what it is that people are after. We want a solution to this problem, and I want to look, for, and we are looking for it. And since we don't get a closing statement, there has been, there's just a little myth busting to do here about property taxes. There's been a lot of mansplaining tonight about property taxes and how they work, a lot of incorrect incorrect explanations about how property taxes work and the history. I was there at the city council when people's property values were going down and we had to increase property taxes by 8% year over year just to make up for the state level cuts. R.T. Ryback was there for that. I was also there with him when we were doing our best to keep it as close to zero as possible after so many years of that. And I was a partner in all of that. And we are in a time of growth, and we as a city have agreed that we want to invest in our parks and that we want to invest in our streets for the next 20 years. And we came up with a set of agreements about how to do that investment through our property taxes. I insisted that we make it real dollars, not fake smoke and mirror dollars. I insisted that we do that, and we did that. And I will take responsibility for that, but I also take credit for the fact that we are investing in our parks and our streets in a way that we could have and should have years ago. Thank you, Mayor Hodges. Uh, Tom Hoke, rent control? Well, I don't think I'm confused about property taxes, but I will say that when we look at rent control, you know, I'm a big believer in really looking at every conceivable option. However, rent control, there is simply no evidence that I know of today that will either improve the quality or the supply of affordable housing. And that really is where our emphasis should be. Al Flowers? Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely for uh, anything that uh, is going to help uh, people. And uh, when we talk about uh, rent control, I'm absolutely for it for a period of time to, to get what's happening in Minneapolis on track. And I'm surprised that uh, they sit here and, uh, and say state law, where state law said don't pass $15 an hour minimum wage. But, they, but you did it, so the high behind the state is disingenuous to me. Uh, I, I think uh, we got to uh, put more people in the housing. Uh, because more, most of the people in rental housing is people that look like me. So we got to make housing affordable, wealth creation. That's the key to, and we won't have to worry about rent, rent control. Let somebody own their own property. And that's what we should be doing at the city of Minneapolis. And uh, that's what I'm going to try to do. Okay. Well, it is uh, just a minute past 8 o'clock, and I think that's the time everyone uh, agreed that we would have to end this forum. Let's have a round of applause for all of the candidates. sponsors and our, uh, our host, the Plymouth Congregational Church, for this uh, beautiful setting for tonight's event. Have a wonderful night and drive safely. <laughs>